Well, today is a significant day. I don't know how many of you realize how significant today is or why it's significant. Uh, but let me just see how switched on we are as a church or as a people. Uh, let me ask you, what happens this week? Did, did anything happen this week? Yeah, yeah. The general election happened this week, didn't it? Yeah. And uh, what happened at the general election? Yeah. Loss, yeah, there definitely was loss. So we now have a new prime minister, yes? Uh, we have a new government, quite significant, and uh, it was a landslide. I don't know how many of you are happy about it, how many of you are sad about it, I don't know. I don't want to get too deep into politics this morning. But I think we have to acknowledge that there's, there is a change in our country and um, uh, things will be a little different from here, I would imagine. Wouldn't you imagine so? Things would be a little different. Uh, we do know that the world has changed quite significantly, don't we? When we look at what's happening in politics, when we look at what's happening in finance, uh, when we look at what's happening in the economy, we can see that the nations are in distress. Uh, nations are starting wars that they can't even finish. They're starting wars that they can't even manage. Uh, people are making enemies out of each other for whatever reason. And it seems to me as though they're biting off more than they can chew because you notice these wars only leads to the financial impov impoverishment of those same nations. Uh, they blow so much money in arms and weapons and warfare and espionage and all this stuff and really uh, it just makes those nations poorer. In fact, it affects the whole world, it makes the whole world poorer. And uh, it's a little bit like what happens when we're squabbling at home, you know? We're squabbling, squabbling at home for our own right. We don't realize that the squabble that we're engaging in is actually working against our own selves. Well, this is happening on a bigger scale with the nations squabbling against each other, not even realizing that the battles that they're picking are actually destroying them themselves and causing other people, innocent people around the world to suffer. And it, it's really something. Now, I was quite amazed when I heard the Labour Party come with this slogan about change. Uh, because Lorna and I had been thinking about change for some time. And uh, we've been talking about the church and how we feel the church needs to change and what we feel we need to do differently and where we think we need to move on from and uh, how we're going to structure change and how we're going to implement change. And you know what they say, nobody likes change. Nobody really likes change. We all like to be comfortable in what we know. Uh, we all have our own little comfort zone. And so, you know, um, change is not, is not easy to implement. Change is not easy to manage. And if you've been an executive or a leader or a manager uh, or in authority, uh, supervisor in any capacity, you know that you can't just run in and implement change on people because when you do that, people start throwing their toys out of the pram, don't they? Because not everybody likes change. People think that where we are is good enough. Uh, this is the way we've always done it. This is the way I want to do it. Oh, I don't fully understand what you're trying to do or why you're trying to do. Some people actually decide they're going to drive their feet into the ground and they're going to become an obstacle to change. They're going to delay change or they're going to slow change down as much as possible. Has anyone here ever been there? How many liars do we have in the church this morning? Uh, I'm going to slow the change down because I don't really like the change. Or I wasn't consulted about the change. Or I don't know what the change is going to be. So I'm going to, you know, I, I, I'm not going to rock the boat, but I'm not really going to be on it. I'm not on it. I'm not in it. I'm not for it. Change is difficult, but change is necessary. If an egg was to remain an egg after it is laid it there, there will be no chicken but worse still uh, C.S. Lewis said something like this an egg cannot remain an egg forever either we must hatch and become a chicken or otherwise we will spoil and die you can't stay in that transitionary situation forever otherwise you may die now I was absolutely amazed when Luana said to me 
We need a radical reset. That's what Lorna said to me several weeks ago. We need a radical reset. She said, look, we've, we've, uh, we've done this merger. Uh, it's worked beautifully. The church is coming together, but we actually need a radical reset. It might have been about six weeks ago she said that to me. And we were discussing this, and uh, we've been wrestling with that phrase quite a while. This morning when I turned on the radio, I heard them saying that the government and the cabinet are going to implement a radical reset. And I said, my wife is definitely a prophet. A radical reset. And you know when new governments come in, what they always do, they do a, uh, every so often, what do they do with the cabinet? They do a reshuffle. They do a reshuffle. And when they do a new reshuffle, what they do is sometimes they bring new people in, and sometimes they take old people out, and sometimes they move people sideways. Uh, but they do all sorts of things because they realize that, you know, you can't stay where you are. I, I was watching the England football match last night, and they were talking about the same thing. They were saying the, the, the art of this game is that once you've done 45 minutes and you go in the dressing room and it's half time, the manager has to work out what adjustments he's going to make, what changes he's going to make. You can't go into the second half the way you came out at the beginning of the match because some of your players, as brilliant as they are, they're tired. And you've got to take some of those players off and bring new players on who may not have the same skill as the players who started, but they've got some speciality. I know the England manager bought on a few players who could shoot penalties. And he was strategic to bring them on a few moments before the end of the game so that should they need to go to penalties, those people would be on the pitch and they were ready to take penalties. Many of those young lads, young boys, for me, came up as cold as ice, steered the, the, the goalie in his eye, wouldn't even look where they were going to kick the ball, and they went up fearlessly, and they put the ball in. Have it. Let's have it. Yeah? And then, I tell you what I love about the football matches, when they start to worship. Na, 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 na. I love it. I love it. I think we could learn something from them football worshippers. When they start playing their tune and the band starts playing and they all start jumping up and at the end of the game and they all get on the line and they all start jumping up. <laughs> yeah? And they start hugging and kissing. Grown men jumping in other grown men's laps. A player scores a goal and they're jumping in and catches him in his lap and they're kissing each other. I saw black men kissing white men and white men kissing black men. I saw racial harmony like I've never seen before. I tell you, it's wonderful. I, I really like the fact that Switzerland got some black players now. France got some black players now. Germany got some black players now. I'm loving the fact that all these European teams are now multiracial. Amen? They got blacks, they got whites, they got uh, mixed heritage. They got, they got everything in there, and I'm just loving it. I just, I just, love, I just love the fact that Unity, there's strength in unity, amen? So change is something that is really important and I wanted to share with you today, it's time for a change. I've been studying this for two weeks. It's time for a change. I thought I'd just have one message. I've probably got three messages, uh, but uh, I'm not going to give you all three today. But it is time for a change. Kia Starmer has been saying it for a while, but I wasn't really paying attention. I wasn't really listening to him. I just thought, yeah, 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 yeah. Barack Obama came with that. The Democratic Party in America came with that when they were trying to get elected. They kept saying, it's change, it's change, it's time for change, it's time for change. I didn't take Kia Starmer too serious, but I tell you what, they definitely brought some change. And we, the Bible says that we should pray for governors and kings and rulers uh, so that uh, their, 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 their work would be successful so that we would have an easier life. So let's be sure to be praying for the Prime Minister and be praying for the government. Now, the role of visionaries is, is to see what, what is yet to come. And if you're a leader or a visionary over any ministry, church, business, company, home, how many know that every mother should be a visionary? Every father should be a visionary. 
because you have something right in your home that you need to be a visionary about. Amen? Most important role in the land, I think, is motherhood, fatherhood, because it all starts there. Amen? Now, a number of pastors over the ages, over the last 20 years or so, have used this phrase, the church that I see. And they've used it to explain to their congregation what they are seeing in the spirit, in the eye of the spirit. What they are seeing before them. Now, when we founded this church some 23, 24 years ago, what we were seeing was that the Great Commission was important and that Jesus had said that we should go into the world and we should teach all nations and that we should baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and that we should teach them all things to observe all things that he had commanded. And Jesus closed off that great commission, that great mission to the church with these words, and lo, I am with you even until the end of the world or of the age. And we said, you know, that's the great commission. That's got to be there for our mission as a church. We've got to be following the great commission. And then we sat in a room with a number of people and we began to brainstorm what in the new era of Micah, what should be the vision for the church? We need a statement that would explain to people what we're about. And this is what we felt the Lord given us collectively, that we wanted to be a vibrant, diverse, multi-generational church family that is continuously growing. And more recently, a group of us sat in a room and we started to ask ourselves, what are the values of Micah? And how can we explain that and express that? And we came up with these three slogans, love God, lead people, uh, sorry, love God, lift people, and lead in life. Love God, lift people, and lead in life. So we, we decided that that should be our values that we communicate to people. That's why we're here. We want to love God with all our heart. We're committed. We're faithful. We want to honor God. We want to serve him. But we also want to lift people. We want to build people up and help them to know Christ for themselves and help them to overcome the challenges of their life and that we want to lead in life. We want to fulfill purpose. We want to fulfill our godly mandate. We want to see people fulfill their full potential and we want to see people's lives influenced and impacted for God. And we all know that that's the mission, the vision, and the values of Micah. But I want to ask you something. What if God has something in mind that is greater than what we are thinking about? What if God has in purpose for us much more than we can ever imagine or ask or think? I don't believe for one minute that God has called us just to come and have church every Sunday. You know, we, we do our life, we do our normal life, we do our work, we do our business, and then we just come here on a Sunday just to have a little church for an hour or two, and then we go back and we continually con continue to do our own, you know, live our own lives. I think God's called us to much more than that. Much more than that. I think when I look at the world and when I look at what's happening in the world and when I look at what's happening in the church worldwide, I think we are definitely living in the last days. And I know that God has a plan to harvest as many souls from this planet as possible before the final trumpet comes. Now, what if this church has been called to reach 5,000 people in this community? What if that's what God has in mind for us? More than just us coming and feeling good and feeling like we go to church and we get something from church. And what if God has in mind that we are going to be the salvation? We are going to be the ark, the Noah's ark, that's going to bring in 5,000 souls from perishing in this area, in this community. What if God is going to use us to reach our family and our friends in quite a profound way so much more than we could think, ask, or imagine? got me thinking that if we are really going to fulfill kingdom mandate, we need to be more than just a cool church, more than just a good church. We need to be doing more than just making sure that our spiritual needs are met. I think we need to accept that we are not really here for us, but we are here for those who have not yet come. <laughs> We need to accept that we are not here for us, but we are here for those 
who are yet to come. I don't know, some of you may not know me that well, but I'm not the kind of guy to do anything in halves. I'm not the kind of guy to just play around with stuff and just, just be very casual about stuff. I'm not that kind of guy. I'm serious about whatever I'm doing. I'm going out 100%. You know, when I was in the corporate world, I didn't play. I went to win. And win I did at every level of my corporate career. I was in a very performance orientated business where every single month they tracked and monitored what you did and every single month they had awards and leaderboards that you needed to top and every single month they had records that you needed to keep or break and tallies that you had to achieve and sales and, 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 and business that you had to write and I flourished at every level of that. Because my mindset is, I'm in it to win it. I'm in it to win it. And I don't say this to boast or to brag, but if I took you to my home or my office to have a look at some of my trophies, you'd probably ask, what are you doing with so many trophies? Were they giving you out trophies as confetti or for nothing? No. I was competing every single month to win something to win some sort of prize or to win some sort of goal or to be top, top office or top region or top manager or, or whatever it was. And I've done, I don't know how many of you have done personality profiles, but uh, you know, um, uh, these psychometric tests that speak, that tell you a bit about your personality and your character. But I've done mine several times. In fact, I'm a master practitioner for those things. I've gone on courses, studied how to take them, studied how to read them, studied how to use them. And we use them in church leadership. We use them in relationships for male and female. We use them in business. Uh, and I, you know, personality profiles, I think, are very, very important. And one of the characteristics that they have for me uh, in my personality profile, I don't mind telling you, is this. People mastery. People mastery. That means that my, the way I think, the way I tick, I was born to lead people. I was born to lead organizations. Now that, this will sound, could sound prideful to some and some will think, oh he's bragging, he's bragging. No, I'm not, I'm not. I'm not bragging at all. I don't think anything of it. I'm just telling you that I'm a similar personality type to Paul in the Bible. I don't come here to play. I come here to win. And God would have to call that kind of personality type to lead when he wants serious things done. So understand that I'm never going to be content, content with mediocre. I'm not the kind of person that's going to be content with us playing church. I'm not wired that way. If I was that kind of person, I would have quit church long ago. The members of the church would have got the better of me. But if there's 500 people in the pew, they can't beat me. If it's a battle between the pastor and the members, every member's going to resign and I'm staying. Because I don't lay down my arms lightly. I fight for what I believe in. I wouldn't last 40 years of marriage unless I fought for what I believe in. I wouldn't be a father and a grandfather and raise family the way that I am unless I was a fighter. I wouldn't have put up with you as long as I've put up with you unless I was a fighter. Turn to your neighbor and say, amen, he's right about that. Some of you know how much I've fought for you, how much I've tolerated with you, how much I've given to you, how much I've died for you. You ain't going to tell nobody, but you know and I know. You could call me at midnight, I get out of my bed, I drive to your house. You can call me during the middle of the day. I make time for you. You could be going through all kinds of stuff and I'm making sure I'm following you through to see if there's anything more I can do to help you. I'm that kind of person. Is it true? I'm, I'm a lion or is it true? So I'm saying all that to say this. Understand that when God says move, I'm going to move. When God says take it higher, I'm going to take it higher. Now, I'm, I'm a bit of a diplomat. I'm always trying to think, how can I take people with me? How can I take people with me? How can I make sure we don't lose anybody? How can I, you know, but every general knows that some soldiers have to die on the battleground. 
And every general knows that there's a certain amount of troops that you are happy to lose, if necessary, in order for you to win the battle. Yeah? In fact, sometimes you've got wounded soldiers and you know that if you leave them there, the enemy's going to come and abuse them. So what do you do? You put the gun to their head and you shoot them. Because it's better that you kill them than you let the enemy kill them. That sounds crazy, but why am I saying that? I'm saying I will do whatever it takes in order to fulfill God's mandate. I don't care who comes. I don't care who goes. I don't care who's with me. I don't care who's against me. I'm going to love everybody. I'm going to treat everybody well. But I don't play. And I don't get caught up in games and dibby dibby stuff because I've got an objective that is bigger than that. I've got to keep my eye on the prize. I can't let people derail me with politics and games. I know what them games. Of course I know what them games. I see what people are doing. Of course I do. I'm too diplomatic though to get caught like that. Because I've got my eye on a bigger prize. Amen? Amen? Understand the kind of guy you're dealing with. So I say all that to say this. As a church, we're at a point now where we need to move from where we are. God said to Moses, pack up the camp, tear down every tent, and move the people from here. And Moses said, whoever's on the Lord's side, come over to me. And whoever's not, good luck to the lot of you. But we are going that way. And I'm saying to you as a church this morning, whoever's on the Lord's side, come over to me. We are not here to play church. I have never, me and my brothers have never been into mega church mentality or personality church mentality. We've never been into trying to put our face on a flyer. We've never been, me and Lord, never been into cheesy marketing for, you know, pastor and his first lady. You know, I've told many of you, I don't care if you call me by my first name. You call Jesus by his first name, don't you? I'm not into titles and positions and all of that stuff. I'm here to serve. I'm not, I didn't come here to be served. I came here to serve. I came here to lead people. I came here to win souls. I'm obsessed by it. Am I perfect? Far from it. Do I always get it right? Far from it. But the passion within me is to serve God. And I tell you, if I didn't have that passion, I would have quit long ago. Brothers and sisters, we as a church are going for growth. I'm not talking about trying to build a big church so I've, I can have a big name. Many of you know, I've had a big name already. I've, I've gone to Australia three times and played at concerts in football stadiums and, 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 and uh, big concert halls and what have you. I've toured the United States. I've sung on the biggest gospel festival in America, the Grant Park Gospel Festival, amongst all the great American gospel stars. Me and my brother's been up there. Up there. The, 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 the mayor of Chicago flew us to Chicago to represent Great Britain as gospel singers and we sang on the stage. I've been on TV, BBC One, ITV, Channel 4, all of those. I've been on TV. Go and look on YouTube. you find some old videos of me. You're probably frightened. You're probably looking at me. Is that him? Yeah, yeah, it's me. Yeah, of us doing t television and stuff like that. I've done all of that. And in sales and marketing, I've been on the stages and had all the accolades. I'm not interested in any of that. I've done it in sports as well. I'm not interested in any of that. I'm not here for that. I've given all those things up that I count as done for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's why I'm here. But when I say I'm going for growth, we're going for financial growth, we're going for numerical growth, we're going for maturity. One of the things that God sowed on my heart more recently is you've got to help your people, you've got to get more finances into the hands of your people. And I've been sitting down and thinking about how do we help people to improve their financial position and their economics? Because we need to liberate our people, get people out of debt, get people out of poverty, get people so they're free, so that they can live lives without stressing over what's going on right now. And you know that the way the economy is set right now and the way that things are right now, people are feeling the pinch. Is it true? And a leader has to try and respond to that. The priority is always the gospel. But we've got to try and help our people to respond to what we see happening. We need to help our people to, be, to become more mature, to develop in God and in Christ. We need to get our, part, our husbands and our wives to stop squabbling at home. 
Uh, we need to get our families to come together as one. We need to get uh, our, our, you know, our families to, to get over the, the squabbles and the challenges and the problems that you get in, in, in family structures and, uh, and, and go for something higher than that. We need to, in our church, we need to improve a number of things. We need to improve our timekeeping at church. Can you say after me? Time keeping. We need to improve our timekeeping. We need to approve our attendance of church. We need to develop a spirit of excellence in all that we do. We need, as Lorna says, a radical reset. So I wanted, to, uh, first of all, just to share with you a few definitions of what change really is before we go into some scriptures. Let's see this first slide, change. So what is change? You know, the Bible says that there were a group of men, there were about 200 of them. They were the leaders of the tribe. They were called the men of Ishika. And the Bible says that the men of Ishika were wise because they knew how to discern the times and the seasons and they knew what to do in the times and the seasons. I, I want to say something to you now. Those of us who have one job, one job, you've got one job and one employer, I want to encourage you with this. This is not the time to have one job and one employer. This is the time for you to start looking to develop multiple streams of income. Because the time is coming when your employer might let you down, might let you go. And if you only have one employer, one business, one trade, you might find yourself in a lot of trouble. In fact, this whole thing about having one job, working for one employer, it's a modern thing. Traditionally, people never did that. Traditionally, people turned their hand to whatever they could to make a living. If they could raise a few chickens, they would raise a few chickens. If they could crochet a few things, they would crochet a few things. If they could be a, a cook, they'd be a cook. Me and my mum were talking the other day, and my mum was reminding me about how her and my dad used to raise chickens in our garden in Carden Road in Nunhead when we were kids. They used to raise chickens in the back garden, as you can imagine. Many of the neighbours were not impressed with that because this is not the country where you raise chickens in your back garden, let's face it. <laughs> that's, a, that's a Caribbean, Africa, Asia, hot country thing. In the UK, in the 60s, 70s, you don't raise chickens in your back garden, but they used to raise chickens in their back garden. And there was every so often they had to kill the chickens, and to kill the chickens they had to cut their necks. And those chickens made a lot of noise when they were dying because they didn't want to die, right? Didn't want to give their lives. And mum used to raise the chickens, kill the chickens, and then sell them to an establishment in town who used to buy chickens from my mum uh, for their catering. And my mum used to work in their kitchen catering as well as other jobs. And I, I was just thinking about how entrepreneurial my mum and dad were, the amount of businesses that they had and the amount of things that they used to turn their hand to. My mum and dad never relied on one employer or one job. And I nev I've never done that either. I've always been a person who's been entrepreneurial, got to have my hands in a few different pies. I'm saying all that to say this, guys, you cannot rely on one employer, even if I'm the employer. You cannot rely on that. Because I could find myself unemployed, and then I have to make you unemployed. I could get to the point where I can't pay myself, and then I can't pay you. Every single one of us need to find multiple streams of income. And where do you find these multiple streams of income from? You find them from where your talents are. Some of you can do hair. You should have some hair clients. Some of you can do beauty. You should have some beauty clients. Some of you can sell things. You should be doing some network marketing. Choose the right companies. Choose the right products. Make sure it's safe. Don't overinvest. But find more than one thing to do. Some of you can, can use your skills as an accountant or as a bookkeeper and offer those skills to somebody else. Find something else to do other than what you're doing, otherwise you will never have enough finance to cope in this economy. You will suffer lack. Now, definition of change. Change refers to making or becoming different undergoing transformation or transition from one state to another. It involves moving from the known to the unknown, adopting to new circumstances, or altering one's path. Now, I know nobody likes change, but we have to change. 
And there's a great saying out there, one of the ancients said, that the only thing that is constant is change. That's the only thing that is constant. You will always be challenged to change. The late great uh, President of the United States, John F. Kennedy said, change is the law of life. Change is the law of life. And those who look only to the past or the present are certain to miss the future. Change is the law of life. You have to get used to change and you have to be ready to change. It's something it took me a while to get used to, but it's a little bit like going down to the fun fair and you hold on to the bumper cars and it don't matter how many bumps and how many knocks you get, your job is to hold on. Change will force us to hold on. Albert Einstein, you know who he is? He said, the measure of influence is the ability to change. The measure of, sorry, the measure of intelligence, excuse me, the measure of intelligence is the ability to change. Benefits of change. Let's look at the next slide quickly. Change can force us to learn and grow, developing new skills and perspectives. Change can help us to clarify our mission and align us more closely with God's will. Now, I think about, with those two, I think about David the shepherd boy. Change caused him to grow. The challenges that he went through as a shepherd caused him to grow. The need to go and fight Goliath caused him to grow. Saul tried to put on his armor on him. David said, I can't put that armor on, but later on, I'll probably be putting on your crown. David didn't know that, but that was the case. The circumstance of David's life caused him to grow. Uh, when David became king, the change that he had to uh, caused him to clarify his mission and align more closely with God's will. Uh, change increases opportunities. It causes us to embrace uh, and to change, uh, uh, to push through open doors and new opportunities that were previously unavailable. Without change, we would not be challenged to grow. Change can strengthen our faith. Change can help us to trust in God and to deepen our faith and our resilience in him. Because when you're undergoing change, you need to seek God's help. You need to, to ask God to steer, you know, Jesus, Savior, pilot me. My mom used to say, Jesus, Savior, pilot me. I, I'm going through turbulence. You, or nowadays, I think they say something like, Jesus, take the wheel. <laughs> Jesus, take the wheel. We're in a racing car. It's turbulent, it's, it's, it's choppy, but Jesus, take the wheel. Third slide, how change leads to greater opportunities and life improvement. Change helps us to expand our, our horizons. It causes us to, to go deeper, to go broader, to develop our experiences. Change helps us to unleash our full potential, because if you just stay where you are, you'll never know what you're really capable of. Just because we did it that way before doesn't mean we must do it that way all the time. How would you stretch? How would you grow? How would you be challenged? Change causes us to grow. Okay? So uh, change unleashes our talents, our abilities, and our full potential. Change helps us to develop new relationships. It brings new people into our lives. It helps us to foster new relationships in new ways. And it helps us to grow as a community. Change enhances innovation. It can stimulate creativity and innovation. So we can, you don't want it like that no more? No, we don't want it like that more. Okay, I'll have to put my thinking cap on. How are we going to do that? Change. It can also drive us to communal achievement. Change encourage us to, encourages us to move forward. As a church... We have to be comfortable with coming out of our comfort zone and stepping into our future because God does not want us to pitch tent here forever. How many of you are ready for change? Now, when Israel were going into captivity, going into slavery, going into exile, they were depressed, they were weeping, and at the moment of their lowest, God spoke a word to them which was so high. God says in Jeremiah 29, uh, 11, we quote it all the time, but we forget or we don't realize the circumstances around them, what they were going through when God said this. 
He was saying to him, listen, no matter what, despite what you're going through, despite where you are, he says, I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Whenever you're going through crisis in your life, remember that God has a plan for your life and that plan is to prosper you and not to harm you. He's going to bring you out. Paul said when he was going through trials and tribulations, he said, brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself to have yet comprehended or to take hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind me, the challenges, the difficulties, the problems, the defeats, I strain, I press, I push forward towards the goal to win the prize. I push heavenwardly. Biblical examples of change. Abraham was told, leave your family, leave your mother, leave your father and go to a land that I will show you. And Abraham had to pack up everything and move from where he was. Thank you. Moses was told to transition from being the prince of Egypt. He became a shepherd boy in Midian. Or a shepherd man. He was quite a man back then. And then God said to him, I want you to go back to Egypt, but this time not as, a, not as a prince. This time I want you to go back as a deliverer. Take my people out of there and bring them to the place that I will show you. So Abraham experienced change. Moses experienced change. Ruth was living a comfort life. And when catastrophe hit the family, people died within the family. And she decided to embrace change, leave her homeland and go and follow Naomi. And then she became in the lineage of Christ because she decided to go where God was forcing her to go. Paul transitioned from persecutor of the church. You know, when we think about Paul, we think about this evil, horrible man. No, 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 no. Paul was a righteous, holy man that was trying to protect God's people from heresy. And he thought that his job was to wipe out Christianity because that was heresy. He was trying to protect the law and God's good name until he realized, you know what? I'm the one that's in the wrong. And God spoke to him and he ended up humbling himself. God humbled him. He humbled himself. Joining those Christians and became the greatest Christian leader we have ever known. Paul said it, he said, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a, new, he's a new creature, he's a new creation. The hold is gone and the new has come. Christianity is all about change. It's all about growth. It's not about sticking where you are. Hebrews 1, 11, as Hebrews 11, 1 says, now faith is the confidence, now faith is having confidence in what we hope for and assurance in what we do not see. To Isaiah, or Isaiah 43, 19, see I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. God is a God of change. We're not going to stay where we are. We're going to change. We're going to move forward. We, we will consult our own feelings. We will consult our own opinions. But hear what Proverb tells us in Proverbs 3, 5 to 6, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to him and he will make your paths straight. To wrap up, I've got some questions to ask you. I think everyone under the sound of my voice, the Holy Spirit wouldn't lead me to speak this message unless there was a reason or a purpose for it. I think everyone under the sound of my voice is being challenged this morning that there is an area in your life, maybe two, maybe three, where you need to change. And here's my question to you. What one area can you put your finger on right now where you need to change? What one thing do you need to do differently than what you used to do? There needs to be a change. And if you wanna see a change in your life, in your marriage, in your family, in your business, in your home, if, if you want to see a change in your church, then you have to become a change. You cannot continue to do things as you used to do them. You cannot continue to speak to your wife the way you speak to your wife. 
You cannot continue to speak to your husband the way you've always spoken to your husband. You cannot afford as a married couple to be squabbling and fighting the way that you've been squabbling and fighting for the last God knows how many years. There needs to be a change. Something has to change. Someone has to give. You need to decide that you are sick and tired of being sick and tired. You need to decide that you are fed up of living a compromised life, that you want to do something different. You need to go home with your partner tonight and say, Honey, I'm done fighting. I resign. Let's call a truce. I'm going to be your biggest fan and you're going to be my biggest fan. We are going to be a team. We are going to be a partnership. Some of us are going to have to make a decision that we're not going to say the things that we used to say anymore. We're not going to speak negative things out of our mouth. We're not going to swear and F and blind and behave unseemly. We're not going to get frustrated and get angry and snap at the kids and snap at the partner. We're going to things, do things differently. This morning, I said to myself, there must be a change and the change must start with me. I could walk in here every Sunday at 10 o'clock or 10.30. That's enough time for me to do what I need to do. But this morning, I felt like, no, you must be a change. You get up, you go to bed even earlier. You do things more differently to how you used to do them. You get to church this morning even earlier than you normally do. And he gave me a time that I should, uh, that he would want me to push myself to make a difference in my life. I could give you all kinds of excuses why I can't be here at a certain time. Let me ask you a question. If your employer was to double your salary, providing you turn up to work one hour earlier every day than you do now, how many of you could do it? Let me see your hand. He's doubling your salary. How many of you could make adjustments? I mean, what would you do? I mean, I'd iron my clothes the night before. Uh, I'd go to bed earlier. Uh, I'd, I'd, I'd change disciplines. Them kids would be getting up one hour earlier. Even if I had to dash cold water on them. I wouldn't be doing that. But I'm just saying, I, the kids would have to get up earlier. The husband would have to get up earlier. I would have to get up earlier because the boss is doubling my salary. So I'm, gonna, I'm not going to do things the way I used to do. I'm going to make sure that all the things I didn't plan for that could happen to me, uh, my timetable will be better than that. What do we need to change? What things do we need to start doing? What things do we need to stop doing? Sometimes it's the small things that make a big difference, a huge difference. Sometimes just saying sorry, just just beginning to, to say sorry to your partner. You know, you're never the one to say sorry. But maybe you just start now saying sorry. Maybe, you, you know, when the arguments, you just stop and you, you hear them out for a change. Or maybe you just stop nagging and moaning and riding his back and riding her back and getting on their nerves. Maybe you just start doing something different. Now, I'm not just speaking to the couples and the married couples. You can take that as singles and use that in your own life and so on. Every single thing we want to see in our life, everything that we've not been seeing, everything that we want for a better life is just outside of our comfort zone. In other words, if you want to see more, if you want to see different, you're going to have to stretch yourself and come out of your comfort zone. It's never going to be convenient. It's never going to be easy. It's going to stretch you. It's going to challenge you. But all, as long as you keep saying, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't, guess what? You can't. You need to start saying, I can. I can. I can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. You know, it's said that people will change when they are hurting enough. Some of us have to go through great pain before we are willing to change. But 
don't, 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 don't suffer that unnecessarily. Sometimes we need to just bite the bullet and make the change. Don't wait for everything to go bad before we're willing to make the change. Here's a quote. You'll never change your life until you change what you are doing daily. Because the routines, the habits, the standards that you have now have served you well to give you what you've got now. But if you want more, you're going to have to do more. You're going to have to go deeper. You're going to have to go broader. You're going to have to go wider. You're going to have to do something differently. The secret of your success is determined by your daily routine and your daily agenda. Since you want more, you have to do something differently. You have to do something more. And as a church, brothers and sisters, as I wrap up, we need to ask ourselves the question, what are we prepared to give in order or do in order to see change, in order to see improvement, in order to see growth? We cannot come here week after week just doing the same old thing. Apart from it being boring, we won't be fulfilling kingdom mandate. I'm sure these musicians who play instruments, they, 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 they have to stretch themselves. They have to practice. They have to do runs every week. They have to uh, do, do something to stimulate growth. If they don't, they won't get any better. They'll just stay where they are. They have to push themselves in order to get better. I have to push myself in order to get better. Let me close with this. I'm saying all that to say this. We, we've now, we're now embarking on a season of change. This nation is now embarking on a season of change. And you need to embark on a season of change. Do you remember when no one could work from home and everybody had to go to an office to work? Let me see the hands of those who work at least one day a week from home now. I mean, that was unthinkable 10 years ago, five years ago. And now it just seems crazy. Why would you get in a car or go on London transport and go to the office at work and waste all that time traveling when you could just get out your pajamas and start work right now and get more done? And then, you know, in between while you're working, you could sort a few domestic things out and pick up the kids. And it's just so much, this is so much more effective. Why would you go across London to a business meeting when you could just go on Zoom and everybody's there? Everybody's there in one room, in one space. Seeing them in person, it's no more quality meeting than it is seeing them on Zoom. But imagine if we all said, no, I, I can't do that. I don't want to change. We'd be stuck in the mud. We're in a period of change and we cannot do things the way we used to do them. We have to bite the bullet and start thinking of new ways to do new things if we want to see new growth. Amen? And I want to ask you and challenge you to think about in your life, what things do you need to change? What things do you need to do differently in order to stimulate growth? Now, I don't know what God's saying to you, but I do know that probably there's as many different ideas as there are people listening. God will be speaking to you in your own way about your own stuff. And I pray that you will act on it. Let's bow our heads and pray. Thank you for listening to the message today. We hope it blessed you. And if it did, please like, comment and subscribe for more videos from Micah. And don't forget to click the notification bell to see when they're uploaded. Thank you for joining us today. We'll see you in the next one.